Uh, I'm so excited about my red shirt. We wear red, y'all wear red. Same team. Um, so, thanks to you for the intro. Um, and I have to start by naming that this is a real full circle moment for me uh, to be addressing the UE 150 convention in 2024. I first learned about UE and really the modern labor movement when I got to North Carolina State, go back, in the late 90s, uh, and uh, met people like Steve Bader and in Gaza Laughing House, and eventually Dante Strabino was a classmate of mine. Uh, my favorite professor was helping to work to organize a unit there. Through that work, I met uh, a person who became a, a mentor and really a father to me, a John Mudillahunt, which meant I met little baby, a John Mudillahunt, who now gets to, is called doctor and speaks in front of the room. <laughs> very close with my beloved Ray Urquhart, uh, and of course I worked uh, long years uh, with your OG, your tireless, brilliant Saladin Muhammad, may he rest in peace. And the only reason I'm getting, oh the picture went away, there was a, there was a, no, you don't need to worry about it. There was a photo of, the only reason I'm getting here to, to speak here today is because our president, Samika Walker Kelly, uh, couldn't be here, she was ill this week. And she's an elementary school music teacher, so had she come, you all might have gotten like, a, like an inspiring song. Instead, you're gonna get the high school history teacher guy. Uh, so I hope you don't get bored. Um, but the other thing I wanna say before I get into what I was asked to talk here about here today, which is some of the, the history of what led to the recent struggles uh, in our schools, and in particular in Durham in the last six months, uh, I have to start also by talking about how much of an honor it is to speak on this ground, where we stand. Right? The only reason that I have the ability to have my job or that we have public schools in North Carolina is because at the end of the Civil War, newly freed African Americans made public education a priority. Right? So when people talk about the Leandro case, right, the reason the Leandro case exists is because newly freed African Americans and their allies put a constitutional mandate into the North Carolina Constitution in 1868. Right? So it is because of that struggle. It is because of that struggle that we have public schools at all. And so that was a heroic effort, but that heroic effort actually unfortunately needed to continue as Jim Crow grew strong, limited people's rights, institutions like the Franklinson Center had to provide services that the state was unwilling to. This place is the definition of transformation, y'all, from a place of pain and shame and evil to a place of love and hope and possibility. And past the sacred role that it played in training black students and black educators in the Jim Crow era, the, in my adult lifetime, this place has served as a place where people come together from all over the country to dream together, to meet, to explore possibilities, and to build our movement like you all are doing here today. So even though I've been to this place dozens of times, it never feels any less sacred or any less special. So it's an honor to stand here on stolen native land on site of some of the slavery's worst degradations and be in a place that is transformed where we are in here together building a multiracial working class movement for power for our people. So I'm extremely grateful for that. I'm also really grateful that I'm a high school history teacher. I don't know about y'all, but we're, we're having a moment these days. <laughs> The lovable, sweet high school history teacher is, is a thing. And uh, shout out to Tim Walls and, and Kamala Harris, who we're going to get in the White House soon. Um, and I don't get to be a history teacher very often um, because I'm the vice president of the union now. So I'm hoping that y'all will indulge me in a little bit of history because I've seen a lot of things over the last 20 years of organizing in public schools in North Carolina. So in 2004, even though I was fully trained and certified, two weeks into the school year, I'm still working at a moving company. Because in the previous two or three decades, North Carolina had invested resources in public schools in a way that made it a place that people wanted to work in public schools and I couldn't even get in the door, right? We had a decent amount of resources. We were treated relatively well as educators. People viewed North Carolina as a state that valued education. People moved here so their kids could go to the strong K-12 public school system and the world-class public university system here. We were headed in the right direction. Then in 2008, we had the audacity to elect the country's first black president, right? And what happened was the right all over the country decided that they were going to stop the shift from our state towards the Democratic Party. 
And so this radical right that we've heard talked about already today rode the Tea Party momentum into control of our state legislature in 2010. And they immediately went after public schools. See, public schools, just like public school workers, are a problem for conservatives. Just like you all are. We don't produce profit for anybody. Just like y'all don't. That flies in the face of the logic that runs our society. We do the work of providing care and holding our communities together, which their sexist rules call women's work and say shouldn't be well compensated. Right? That's the work that public sector workers do. And we, as public school educators, work in the only places where people connect across race in our society anymore. And that's the scariest part for the right. That's the real danger, y'all. Because if they keep us separate and we never in real relationship with each other, they can lie to us about who each other is. They can tell white people that immigrants are invading and trying to take our stuff. They can tell us that when black people get more rights, that that is somehow taking something away from us. And they have to do that, y'all. They have to do that to divide us from each other, to exploit us and make our lives harder for their benefit because there's way more of us. And our lives look way more like each other's than they look like theirs. That's right. And so when we all go to school together and have public lives together and play ball together and eat lunch together and learn together and date each other and connect with each other's families and go to each other's cookouts and practice our faith together and stand together in our unions together, we are very dangerous. And they know that. People have alluded up here before to the long, the long history of what the right's been building. Y'all, the movement for school vouchers and privatization that we're seeing right now starts with the passage of Brown versus the board in the 1950s when they demanded that public schools be desegregated. Because they knew that if we all grew up in the same places together, their hateful and greedy lifestyle would be over. Just like the laws that prevent us from having collective bargaining as public sector workers, right, denying us our basic human rights, these are Jim Crow laws. Because they know if we have a vibrant, healthy, well-funded public sector, they can't keep dominating us, right? They know that strong public sector unions are going to produce health care, are going to produce good hospitals, are going to produce good schools, are going to produce public transportation, and all the things that they got to go in their wallets and pay for that we deserve. That's why they're scared of letting us teach our history, and that's why they're scared of us organizing. So the recent history of NCAE is full of organizing and full of teaching. So since I know there's some organizing nerds in this room, and I got some questions before I came here to tell the story of how we got to the struggle that happened in Durham over the course of the last year, uh, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about how we got here in hopes that it makes us all a little stronger and a little scarier on the other side. So I became a teacher in 2004 because I wanted to organize teachers. That was my goal. Um, and I did not think at the time that NCAE could be a vehicle to organize teachers, right? We were seeing poor leadership in our districts. We were seeing top-down reforms. We were seeing budget cuts from the state, and the union did not seem like it could muster a response. In fact, people inside of the union wouldn't even call it a union because, you know, in North Carolina, unions are illegal, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So then a couple of them, right? right? You hear the word I'm using. So a couple things happened. Right? In 2012, the Chicago, the Chicago Teachers Union went on a powerful strike for the first week of school. Right? And they stood, this is a world changing strike. They stood arm in arm with their students and parents, and they won massive wins. Not just for teachers, but for all school staff, for parents, and for kids. Y'all, they expanded the possibilities of what we could bargain for, and they fought for things like resources, like legal resources for immigrant families whose kids were facing deportation. They put that in their contract, y'all, right? And so when they filled the streets with red, and Karen Jennings Lewis got in front of folks and talked about what we needed to fight for, they sparked a movement, right? And at the same time, Reverend Barber and the Moral Monday movement is lighting fires, lighting flames all over our state. Right? So thousands of people are arrested in one summer, and when the NCAE leadership joins in that, that gives us a possibility, some openings to organize our locals. So we started to organize our locals. And we started at the bottom, y'all. Like, real at the bottom. When I took over the leadership uh, as the president of the Durham Association of Educators in 2015, we were down to 525 members, up 
from down from 1300 that we had had just six years earlier. So we were in a total collapse, right? And that's out of 5,000 possible staff wall to wall. So we're at 10% and I could get six people to come to a meeting in 2015, right? But immediately we started running campaigns. We want a raise for classified staff who hadn't seen a raise in seven years. We took our custodians who were working for private companies and were getting exploited left and right. And we brought them in house in DPS. So they got a quick raise, they got benefits, right? They got into the state healthcare system. elected people to our school board. We won free speech rights for educators. And when immigration police kidnapped one of our kids in his front yard in front of his mother and threatened to deport him and kept him in a holding cell in Georgia, we took the fight all the way to Congress and the Department of Homeland Security, stopped his deportation, ended his detention, and brought him home to graduate his class. also helped to lead two of the biggest labor demonstrations in the history of our state, right? How many of y'all were in the streets with us in May of 2018 and May of 2019, right? Sea of red out there, right? We were 30,000 deep in the streets, y'all, 30,000 deep, and nobody lost their job doing something that was considered to be illegal. was we were expanding our imaginations, we were building momentum, and a team of us that were rebuilding our, our locals got elected to statewide leadership, right? Things were headed in the right direction. Then COVID hits, right? And society shuts down. And public sector workers, like y'all, saved the entire society. So if you didn't hear it then, and I know you're not gonna hear it enough ever, thank you. You all kept us going, public school workers kept us going through some of the darkest days we've ever seen, right? And so while we were grouped and made some tough decisions at the state level, moved resources around, hired some new people focused on organizing, the Durham team kept chugging, right? So one year ago, right now, I'm gonna ask y'all to remember some numbers in your head. One year ago, right now, Durham had newly elected leadership. They had the support of a couple of really talented and hungry staff, and they had 880 members, okay? 880 out of 5,000. But more importantly, what they had a year ago right now was audacity. They had audacity. Yeah. And what they said was, we're gonna have a new plan this year. Number one, plan. We're gonna talk to a majority of workers in every single building. We're gonna ask them to join. We're gonna find out what they need most and we're gonna turn that into a campaign to fight for the biggest amount of money we've ever seen in a county budget before. Two. We were gonna build an organizing structure that had for every leader in our buildings, there were gonna be 10 staff members that they related to. We were gonna build a structure that we could talk to our people every day like this. And three, we were gonna win over a majority of the workers in the district to join the union formally, either through direct asks or through a campaign called Commit to Majority, where they signed a card that said they would become legal as soon as we hit majority. So we started the year thinking this was where we were gonna go. And if we could use this bold campaign to win a majority, then we could push for formal recognition for the district and a robust meet and confer policy, right? Where we could have a formal seat at the table. And from there, we could start to challenge collective bargaining laws, right? By growing our power and expanding the number of things that we were talking to them about in our meet and confer sessions. But winning the majority is the thing that would change the game. So we were well on our way towards that majority when the district in January finally had to admit that it had made an accounting error. <laughs> and over MLK weekend, they sent an email to thousands of staff saying that their pay would be cut in weeks, right? There were these wildcat efforts in a couple of different buildings, a couple of departments were shut down, some schools got disrupted here and there, but DAE's leadership was bringing our, organization, our organizing committee together to figure out what it was we wanted to do. Pretty quickly, within a week, we mobilized over a thousand of our folks, parents, students, allies, and workers together to go to the school board and fight and demand that they keep the January checks the same and nobody's money could get clawed back. We won both of those things immediately. In the weeks that followed, we organized to win the same pay for February and March. We organized two Two, illegal days of strike actions. 
organizing committee, and to make those things happen, organizing committee leaders had conversations in their buildings for several days, and if 75% of the building committed to the action, they would join the other buildings on the picket lines for one of those two days. Because we didn't shut down the schools and stay at home on our couches. We marched in front of the school board with picket signs, again, taking illegal action in defiance of state laws that limit our rights as workers. No one lost their job, no one was punished. So in the months that followed, the organizing committee grew, the membership grew, and we had signatures on a petition that got over two-thirds of the district staff signing a petition. Over two-thirds, a super majority. So then in May, we hit our majority membership. We got to over 2,600 people from 880 in less than a year. Okay? With all that momentum, we had hundreds of parents and community supporters writing letters. We had historic turnouts at the school board meeting and county commission meeting. And in June, we managed to win $27 million additionally yeah. from the county, when the most we've ever gotten before was 11. We've been fighting them for more money for over a decade. The most we ever got was 11. This year, we got 27. Woo! Okay. This year, the goal is to get to supermajority membership increase the depth and reach of our organizing committee, and win a formal meet and confer policy that recognizes us as the union we are. Yes. Right? So it wasn't overnight, it wasn't a year, and it will take longer than another year to build the union and movement that we need to defend and transform our schools. It's been a nine year journey in Durham to get to this place, and we've learned a lot along the way, but one piece of learning that we got in this last year feels like the most crucial thing to offer. Growing up in a state, like I did, where union rights are limited this severely, also severely limits our imagination. Even though I was eight years into the project of building this union and pushing every single boundary, right? Like local unions don't get kids' deportations ended. That doesn't happen. We were pushing boundaries for eight years. We did not imagine, we did not conceive of what it would mean to win majority membership because we've been so beat down in this state for so long. And you can win things if you run effective campaigns and use communication tools well. You can win local elections that shape the landscape of where the fight that you're on, but until we can say that we represent a majority of the workers in our buildings and our locals, we are going to continue to fight from a place of weakness. Now, the strength of majorities for NCAE is at the center of our vision. We want to work to win a majority of staff to membership in our work sites, we want to move a majority of members and parents to take action together, and we want to be part of moving majorities to the ballot boxes to win the elections and create more possibilities for our lives to be better. Our people are focused. Our goal is to double our membership by 2030. We're going to help win Supreme Court seats in North Carolina in 24 and 26 right. and 28 right. so that we can win fair elections in 2030 and we can start rolling back these policies and heading towards the communities and schools that our kids deserve starting in the 2030s, right? Public school educators love a plan, now our folks have a plan and they feel focused and they feel ready. So that's where I'd like to leave things today. Nobody is coming to save us, y'all. No one is coming to save us. And we don't like people doing things to us, but the opposite of people doing things to us is not someone doing something for us. The opposite of people doing things to us is us being able to do things for ourselves. Amen. That's what power is. That's agency, that's power, that's freedom, that's what we're fighting for. And too many people in our union for too long were looking at the union as something to fix something for them. And what we saw this year was a shift. In the last few days, before we reached the majority campaign, I was on a text thread with the organizing committee. And y'all, I'm at the office all day. These folks are at school supposed to be teaching kids. Every five seconds, someone sends in a text. I'm talking to this person. I'm going over to that building. Did you guys talk to these coworkers, right? And people were hitting up each other's buildings five deep in the parking lot at 5.45 in the morning, waiting until workers came so that they could then sign up as many members and then head to their workplace. It was like a pack of hungry wolves, y'all. That was not the staff that won that majority for them. That was their majority that they got to person by person, ask by ask, challenge by challenge. And, they're, and, and we are not going to be able to take that majority away from them yes. because they earned it themselves. Nobody did it for them. Woo! 
So we could be less than a decade away from repealing the ban on collective bargaining in our state. The people in this room could see the final defeat of Jim Crow and the expansion of our ability to control our lives and improve the lives of our communities. But we have to take this personally and we have to act with urgency. The majority of people out here, y'all, are on our side. I want to say that again. Say the majority it. of the people in our communities, in our state, in our country, in our world are on our side. Yes. Okay? And if we fight effectively, they will join us. Right? And we will win all the things that our people deserve. So thank you, UE150, for being the model and the leaders that have set the tone for our state for over for two decades now, right? Going on three. We stand with you as NCAE. We stand with you today and every day as we work to fight to end racism, to grow the power of the working class, and to transform the world around us through our unions. I'm so grateful. Y'all have a great convention this weekend.